So from here on out, you guys can just call it ESLP. Really easy. Um, my name is Haley. This is Isis, and that's Spencer. And um, we are your student facilitators for this class. We are really excited to be here. We've worked really hard, and we're so glad that there's so many of you. There's 155 of you enrolled in this class who are still trickling in, but we're really excited to have you all here. So probably a lot of you guys have either met us before or you know, once or twice, maybe in an activities fair, and we may have said something to you like, are you interested in the environment? The thing to know is that we were kind of lying, and actually this is not technically an environment class, it's a sustainability class. And so they're different concepts, and sustainability is kind of a broad concept, and we kind of wanted to start off by talking a little bit about what it is, what it means. Um, <laughs> that sustainability encompasses a lot of different fields, a lot of different disciplines. You guys are all interested in it, so that's just really cool. Um, do you want to hit the slide? So sustainability, a lot of you guys are probably familiar, you know, sort of what things fall into the category, but we wanted to go ahead and talk about what our definition of sustainability that we're working around for this class is. So there are, what we're working off of is the three E's, and they're ecology, economy, and equity. Woo she's, she's the leader of E3, the club. Um, so anyway. We have, we have these three concepts that we sort of want you guys to think of as sort of the ways to interpret what you hear from the speakers, what you think about in terms of this class. And we're going to go into a little bit about what each of these three E's means. The first one is ecology, and this is kind of probably what you guys think of as normal or traditional environmentalism. It has to do with things like maintaining biodiversity and making sure our air and water and soil are healthy. Um, it basically has to do with um, humans, or not humans, rather the planet rather than humans. So you guys are probably all familiar with that. What you might not be so familiar with is economy. And there's another cartoon. I don't know if you guys think it's funny. I did, but anyway. Um, so economy has to do with the fact that we can't really just revert to being cave people in this society that we live in today because we do live in a globalized society with economies and politics and governments. And so any solutions that we choose to implement have to work within that framework. So that's kind of the economy idea. It has to pertain to things like green jobs, green business, um, other things like recycling even, packaging. And then the last E is equity. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but this is often kind of overlooked, and it's my favorite of the three E's. Just come on in. Find a spot. <laughs> anyway, so um, in this, I don't know if you guys can see, the, the car has, it, it says developed countries on it, and the, the developed country is emitting um, emissions. And he's telling the guy in the undeveloped country that he has to take care of it with his trees. Point is, this has to do with all of the different people in the planet, and it has to do with the fact that any solutions, like I said, that we implement, have to be available to all people, especially traditionally underrepresented groups. Um, so all of these are really good things to keep in mind while you guys are listening to speakers, while you guys are thinking about sustainability, doing your assignments, that kind of thing. Um, and I hope you guys were paying attention because it's time for your first assignment. Kind of. Not really. Don't get scared. Um, Isis and Spencer are passing out an assignment right now. It's a little worksheet to do. There's one for every three of you guys. So you need to get into groups of three. Get, get cozy with your neighbors. Um, and you're just going to go through this worksheet, and you're going to figure out, yeah, just like this guy. Um, and you're going to just work through the worksheet, find out what kind of sustainability you guys are. Um, just a show of hands, who got that they were an environmentalist? A lot of you guys. Who got that they were an economist? Still a lot of you guys. Who got that they were a humanist? All right, so it was pretty, I mean, not completely evenly divided, but the point is that there's lots of different ways of looking at sustainability. You guys all came up with you know, various pieces. Even within these three E's, you guys all came up with different things. So, um, and now I would love to pass you off to our wonderful Isis Kraus, who is going to introduce herself. Hey guys. So my name is Isis Kraus, and we're each going to tell you a little bit more about ourselves. Um, not because we're super cool, even though we are, but more just to let you know, um, you know, where we're coming from. We are student facilitators here. We aren't professors. And so hopefully hearing a little bit more about our backgrounds, you can 
really cute, huh? Um, hopefully, you guys will feel more comfortable coming to, up and talking to us or asking questions. So like I said, my name is Isis. Um, I came to UCLA after having gone to culinary school for a year in London. I know nothing to do with sustainability. I came in undeclared, and I didn't come in undeclared because I wasn't passionate or didn't have interests. It's just that I didn't want to decide on one thing. I didn't want to just be a businesswoman or a lawyer or something with a singular title. I ended up taking ESLP my freshman year, and I was sitting right there. Um, and it was the first time that I learned about sustainability. I had heard about the environmental movement, like most of you probably have, but no one had framed it as the three E's, as Haley was talking about. And hearing it like that really just clicked for me, and I became really passionate about it. I ended up leading the lecture series the quarter after, which was last fall, and here I am again leading it again. So it's not because I'm an expert in sustainability or know more than probably a lot of you do. It's just that this is what I ended up being passionate about and wanted to do. So yeah, that's a little bit about myself. And I hope you guys enjoy this class. And um, as it's a student-led class, we really hope that you guys engage in it and are really interactive with us and make this one of the best classes you take. So here is Spencer. Just kidding, Spencer doesn't get to talk. Um, I'm gonna talk some more. <laughs> okay, so I am Haley Mahler, and he'll, he'll talk in a minute, don't worry. Um, I am a third year environmental science major, and kind of like ISIS, I didn't really know what I was gonna do when I got to UCLA. I came in as an English major, English majors in the house, what, what? Um, and then I kind of immediately switched to physiological sciences, and I was gonna do pre-med, pre-meds? Okay, no, no pre-meds. <laughs> anyway, well, that's okay, I'm not either. Um, so I took the GE cluster, Global Environment, and I really liked it, and I pretty much immediately switched my major again, but this time it stuck, to environmental science. And kind of when I, when I thought about it, it really made a lot of sense, because I grew up in the Bay Area, um, yeah. And, and my parents were kind of hippies in their day, so we did a student groups and so many things that you can get involved with. I don't know how you couldn't get excited about something, and I got excited about sustainability. Um, so here I am, and I wanted to just tell you guys what we expect from you in this class. We aren't trying to turn you into hippies. We're not hippies. I'm not trying to recruit you guys to go to Death Valley with me on another family road trip. Um, what, what you're here for is to just take whatever you want from this class, whatever feels right for you. Some of you might stop showering and keep the lights off all night or whenever you're trying to study because of the way you feel. Some of you might not do anything differently, but think about these things in the future. And we just want you guys to keep in mind that sustainability should be and can be part of your lives at UCLA and beyond, and just take what you will from this class. Um, and without further ado, Spencer finally gets to speak. Hey guys, how about Haley and Isis, right? Um, so my name is Spencer Hill. I am a third year double major in applied mathematics and atmospheric, oceanic, and environmental science. Where are my double major applied math, ma atmospheric, oceanic, and environmental science majors at? <laughs> I, I actually think I might be the only one in the school. So. Um, so unlike most of you, I actually grew up mostly outside of the state. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, any out-of-state people? Yeah, you're not alone. Don't worry. Um, so yeah, so my story is somewhat similar to theirs in that I came into school here at UCLA not knowing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, what I did know is that I wanted to do something big with my life and that uh, I really like math. Um, <laughs> it'll make sense. I'm getting there. Like, the thing about math and being a mathematician, I guess, if that's what I call myself, is that I live for solving problems. You know, like, what drives me in life is that rush of the aha moment, you know, when you're doing your math homework and you're working on a really tough problem and you mess it up like four or five times and finally, like, something clicks with you. You realize, like, this is what you do. And you finish the problem and, like, get to the back of the book and check you got the right answer. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, for me, that's, like, really big. And, um... What I realized is that I want to spend my life solving problems, finding those aha moments. And so climate change came to me as one of these big problems I could spend my life um, solving, really. And it was because of ESLP my freshman year. I think I sat right there. It's empty. But um, <laughs> it's because of ESLP my freshman year that I came to uh, climate change and especially to sustainability as a response to climate change um, as what I wanted to do with my life. And so... Um, the thing about all this stuff, we're talking about a lot of problems in this class, but um, 
really though the stakes are high, the opportunities are really limitless um, at a personal and global level. Um, and I just want you all to realize that everybody has a part to play in the solution, even if you're not a math major. Um, okay, so that's us in a nutshell. And um, now we're going to transition over to talking about what ESLP is. So, yeah, that's great that you know who we are and what sustainability is. That's important. But, I mean, what is this space? Like, what are we, where are we going to go over the next te 10 weeks in this little journey of ours? Um, and Isis and I are going to tell you about that. Um, so first off, as Haley mentioned, ESLP is an acronym for an unfortunately long name that, yeah, there's that. But um, also how Haley was talking about sustainability being kind of harder to define than to describe, um, ESLP operates in the same way in that we're kind of hard to classify because we're a lot of things at once. So um, basically the best we can do is boil it down into four main elements, if you will. And uh, so we're going to tell you about each of those. So all at the same time, ESLP is, as you can see, a class, a student organization, a statewide movement, and a community. Yeah, lots of good feelings. So uh, Isis is going to tell a little more. So like Spencer said, we are a class, um, Environment 185A. You guys all signed up through URSA. We're run through the Institute of the Environment, which is a wonderful department. Um, we're also, um, obviously, a guest lecture series. So every week we'll be bringing, bringing in different speakers to talk to you about different issues. And um, welcome all of your friends to come and audit the class with you. We're welcoming anyone to come and see it. Um, the main point of the class is to expose you to a breadth of topics and also you know, give you a really solutions focused lens for these things so that you can hopefully take some of that with you in whatever you choose to do later in your life. Um, and as we were, have all been saying a whole bunch, our entire goal is to empower all of you. Like we said, we were sitting in those seats just like you are now and hopefully a few of you will you know, be excited enough to come up here and do the same exact thing next year. So besides being a class, we're also a student organization. There's three main parts to us, the lecture series, which you're all sitting in. We also have a film series. Haley and Spencer ran it last year. It was amazing. We showed a different documentary every other week up on the hill for the entire year. Um, different documentaries like Who Killed the Electric Car, um, all those amazing movies. Um, we'll have a couple of those this quarter as well, and hopefully some of you will come out to those. Um, and then the third part of ESLP is a research, um, sustainability research program called the Action Research Teams. We had eight amazing teams last year, and because of their work, we ended up, UCLA ended up landing in the top number nine out of ten um, for the Sierra Club's top green schools list. We were cited in that report, so all of you who were in that last year, give yourselves a big round of applause. Um, we'll have some field trips and events, and there's things that you can do all year long to stay involved with ESLP if you really like it. Um, yeah, so here's Spencer. Okay, continuing on, uh, ESLP is, we are a student organization here on campus, we are a class, but we are also part of a larger statewide movement. Uh, we are one of many chapters of the CSSC, or the California Student Sustainability Coalition. I'm sorry, there's a lot of unfortunate acronyms in this class. Um, anyhow, they're a network of different organizations at the UCs, at Cal States, at City Colleges, all relating to sustainability. Uh, they do leadership retreats, they do convergences twice a year. Um, really cool group of people. I encourage you to check them out. Um, one of our sister uh, groups of the CSSC is E3. Um, they are a uh, group here on campus. So whereas ESLP, they're, they're our sister group. So whereas we are all about education, uh, they're more about activism. So they're doing things like beach cleanups, fair trade coffee campaign in Kirkhoff, you guys saw that, um, handing out CFLs to uh, low income communities. So um, Becky here, wave your hand a little bit. There's Becky, she's the co-chair of the E3. So encourage you to check them out as well. And then also we just partner with a host of other organizations up here. Um, Sorry again with the acronyms, but um, I encourage you to check those out as well. So main thing is that we're connected and this is part of something bigger here. Um, and lastly, uh, like I said, we are a community, meaning that um, 
we want this to be a space where you feel comfortable and at home and uh, welcome uh, because this is really the only class on campus that is literally all about you. I mean, it's all designed um, solely for your education um, and your empowerment, not for uh, you know, meeting academic requirements necessarily. Um, yeah, that's important, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, when I, we say this isn't a monologue, meaning that this isn't intended to be us talking at you just one way the whole time, though. It, sorry for that right now. But um, meaning that this is supposed to be kind of a dialogue or even an open discussion in the course. Though we are a lecture series format where it is mostly speakers talking to you, um, it shouldn't just be a one-way valve, you know, where it's just information going to you guys. We want this to be an open thing. Um, so that requires that you're engaged and open-minded with all this stuff, um, being attentive and also uh, considering points of view that you wouldn't normally. At the same time, think critically about what these speakers are saying. Don't just take anything at face value. Um, and that kind of means expanding your comfort zone. So um, we want you to be comfortable, but at the same time, I encourage you to challenge yourself, whether that's asking a question when you normally wouldn't in a class this size, or sitting towards the front, or speaking up when you disagree with something, or you know, coming to talk to us after class because you really were inspired by something during the lecture. Um, go for it. Uh, lastly, um, most importantly, we want you guys to have fun in here. Um, we are the only student-run class on campus that we know of, and so it would be a real waste it would be a real waste if we just made this a boring lecture because, I mean, we're, we're students too. We've gone through plenty of those ourselves. Um, but it takes two to tango, kind of, meaning that um, come in energized, like enthusiastic, and uh, we'll do our best to keep that up um, on our end. So basically, we want you to come to class each day and leave feeling educated and informed and concerned about what's going on but much more importantly, feeling energized and enthusiastic and inspired and ready to take action. Um, <laughs> sweet. Um, okay, and so then, uh, so that's that. So that's ESLP in a nutshell. Now we're going to hand it over to Isis. To um, this right here is our website, and hopefully most of you have already gone to that. But this is a great place to find past YouTube videos of our lecturers, more information about the lecture series, the film series, the action research teams. Um, you can download the PowerPoints for the action research team. So it's just a great place to go if you want to learn more about ESLP. Um, OK, so now we're going to go through the speaker list. OK, Haley and I are going to fly through this speaker schedule real quick, just so you know. And then November, the Veterans Day thing, just Wait till next week. Um, okay, week one, which is today, I'm going to give Professor McDonald a full introduction in just a minute. So, um, anyways, week two is our food week. We have Tara Cola, who's of Silver Lake Farm. She's going to talk about farmers markets in Los Angeles, as well as Mud Baron. Yes, that's his real name. Um, he's he does a school gardening program with the LA Unified School District, and he's going to talk about his work there. Uh, week three, we have uh, our water week. So water is a very important, often overlooked issue, especially in California. Uh, we have Lisa Cost Boyle of Heal the Bay, among other organizations, to talk about water issues. She's also the director of a film called Tapped, an upcoming documentary about water. And it's going to be filmed, uh, it's going to be screened on campus here within the next few months. So look for, for more information. What's that? October 24th. October 24th, in fact. Um, so look for more information there. Um, in the f coming weeks. Week four, we have, if I get the next slide, Isis, thank you. Um, art and architecture. Art in the context of this course, meaning action research teams. So we have uh, Miss Isis Krauss of ESLP at UCLA going to present uh, about the research teams. And then we have um, a couple, literally a couple, because they're married, of green architects, <laughs> right? Get it? Um, Michael and Mia Lair, um, they both individually have their own uh, green architecture firms, and they do amazing work in the city, so check them out. Week five, we have our uh, private sector, public sector solutions week. So first, coming out all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, just to speak at our lecture series, we have Amy Lucan of Interface Incorporated. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, Interface is the model, in my mind, of a sustainable company and what green business really can be. They make uh, industrial carpet, of all things. but. Uh, 
That's great. And then we have Mr. Jonathan Parfrey of the LA Department of Water and Power. Um, he's on the commission. He's also director of Green LA, which is a non nonprofit group uh, promoting sustainability in Los Angeles. So private sector, public sector. Week six. Week six is our Eco Celebrity Week. I don't know how many of you know about Adam Warbach, but he is he was the youngest ever president of the Sierra Club at age 23. And he is going to be coming and talking. He does green consulting now for Saatchi and Saatchi S. So he'll be coming in, as well as John Lisko, who works for Saatchi and Saatchi LA, which is a marketing company. Um, he does green marketing for the Toyota Prius. I don't know if anyone's seen the flowers in Yerba, Yerba Buena Gardens. Um, really creative campaign. So he'll let us know how that happened. We also have, on week seven, two different looks at some climate solutions. One of them will be... Um, Kara Horowitz from the UCLA Emmett Center for Climate Change and Environment at UCLA. And she will be talking about uh, environmental policy. We also have Salesh Rao, who has his own quite different solution for um, climate change, which involves international um, solar cookers. I'm going to leave you with that and let you think about it. Um, week eight is my personal favorite week. I am really into transportation. Um, we have Paul Scott of Plug in America coming to talk about electric vehicles and sort of that whole spectrum of the future of transportation, as well as we're going to play with James Rojas. He's going to show us how to play with Legos and build our own transportation systems. So if you have to miss a week, don't miss a week, first of all. But if you have to miss a week, make sure it's not that one because we're going to be playing with toys the whole time. Um, week nine, like we said, Thanksgiving holiday. We want you guys to get home to your families, enjoy some toka furkey or whatever. Um, and week 10, we're going to close it out with design. We have design and public health. We have um, Kim Carls Rudd and Danny's, Danny Phillips from Project H Design talking about design, sustainable design. And we'll finish it off with uh, Professor Richard Jackson of the UCLA Public Health um, Department. And he's going to talk about what all of these issues mean for your personal health. So that's our lineup. We're really excited about it. It took us a really long time to put it all together, a lot of work. And we hope that you guys appreciate it and enjoy it as much as we will. So now we have our very first speaker of the series, and Spencer's going to give a warm introduction to Glenn McDonald. Don't clap yet. Don't clap yet. <laughs> okay. So they're going to set up the PowerPoint for Glenn here. Um, anyways, uh, Professor McDonald is the, as of a few months ago, the acting, the new director of UCLA's Institute of the Environment. Um, he's a professor in both the geography departments and the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Um, his research on climate change and drought has uh, led him all over the world, literally from the Arctic to Hawaii to West Africa. And among other huge accomplishments, he's even testified ahead of the United States Senate Appropriations Committee as an expert. Um, so, assuming we're, there we go. Um, let's give, please give a warm welcome to Professor Glenn McDonald. Can everybody hear me back there? Okay, so first off, I mean, what an amazing group of, of student teachers you guys have. I mean, I'm, that's just an amazing lineup. They are amazing. And you guys are absolutely exceptional for taking this course. It's very, very cool. And this is why UC Education is the best in the world. UCLA, when you leave here, it's going to cut the mustard with employers, organizations, and everything else, okay? Because, I mean, you're getting to the point here at this school we're not only taking classes, but students are offering classes. And I'm really, really proud to be part of that. Um, they, what they've asked me, I'm the director of the Institute of the Environment. If any of you get so totally motivated that you have to have a degree in environmental science, which I think is a really excellent thing to do, we offer a really, really amazing degree uh, in environmental science. And if, let's say, the science thing is not your, your bag, you're a social scientist, how many people are really into social sciences more than that? Okay, geography has a degree in environmental studies, which is more aimed towards maybe more of a social sciences perspective. So you might want to check out that Department of Geography if what you want to do is environmental studies. But I think we have a very, very fine group of students. That major is the fastest growing on campus. It went in th three years from six students to right now we have 212 majors signed up. Okay, it's just amazing. So yeah, good, good for you guys, all right? Now, so th I was asked to speak a little bit about where I came from, how I got into doing this, how I ended up being like the director of the UCLA Institute of the Environment and a professor here. And it is really amazing. I grew up in 
Anyone know where that is? Anyone from the Bay Area? Anyone from San Jose? No, yeah, like she's like, I deny it. No, not San Jose. I grew up from the east side of San Jose, okay, and my first job was at the San Jose flea market, and my sister still works there. Um, university education, didn't have it in my family, anything like that. You know, I started out taking classes at San Jose City College, all right? None of my close friends have graduated from university. They all went into construction trades. They all make a lot more money than I do, too, okay? <laughs> So they did, they did well, okay, people from the east side do well. But that was my, my upbringing, that's, that's my town. And I was so fortunate to have the chance to go to UC Berkeley. You know, I had really excellent teachers at community college. They said, well, why don't you think about, you know, four-year degree. One lecturer was from Berkeley. The next thing you know, I ended up at Berkeley. And at that point, I was getting into conservation and natural resources and things like that. And then I took a course uh, in the geography department there, and I was toying between botany and, and geography and, and conservation and forestry, I took a course on environment and climate change. And that course then set the course for the rest of my life, because I got so into climate change, environmental change, that what we see out there today is changing, that humans are having an impact on the environment and actually going to change what the Sierras look like. I just thought it was amazing. And so I went to Berkeley. If anyone's been there, that's the Sather Gate at Berkeley. And uh, from there then, OK, I went to my biker phase. And uh, <laughs> I ended up in Alberta, Canada, way north of the border, to do a master's uh, in, in physical geography looking at climate and environmental change. And I got very into standing out on frozen or semi-frozen lakes and taking cores of the sediment in the lake to reconstruct long-term histories of what those lakes or swamps were like, how humans had impacted them, you know, over hundreds of years to thousands of years. And so I got very good at reconstructing what past environments were like, using all kinds of different evidence, what the climate was like in the past, 100, 1,000, 10,000 years ago. And those are some pictures of when I was young and couldn't afford a barber or a shave or anything like that. I'm, by the way, the skinny guy, OK? Just got to get that straight. Um, and then from there, I went to University of Toronto, and I did a doctorate in botany. And it was, again, my focus was on climate change. The world was changing. I wanted to understand how rapid that change was, what the world was heading towards. Has it ever been like that in the past? You know, I wanted to, I wanted to understand how, in, how vegetation and ecosystems respond to climate change. And I ended up doing a lot of work in the Arctic in the Canadian Arctic, and which was a pretty amazing adventure for a guy from the east side of San Jose. Okay, it was just like, out there I just sometimes just still can't believe it. From there, I started working in Russia. Because, of course, when you look at the world from the top, from the North Pole, you understand that there's one big continuum that goes from Alaska all the way across Canada all the way across Europe, across Siberia, and back to Alaska. The Circumarctic. We are really so close to Asia that when you stand in former Governor Sarah Palin state, you do see not just Russia, but remember that's Russia and Asia. Okay? We were part of one big system, and I was very interested to know if I could find the same sorts of changes in the environment of the Arctic that were happening in Canada and Alaska, if I could find them in Siberia and northern Russia. And so I continued poking holes in the ground using all kinds of interesting things and doing research on climate change there. And in fact, my first day as a UCLA faculty member, okay, I was uh, in northern Russia and uh, in a little tiny, tiny town in northern Russia. But I brought with me, July 1st, that's when academic appointments begin, I brought with me a blue UCLA t-shirt. <laughs> So that morning, I was a totally, I was a Bruin. And, you know, very, very proud indeed to, uh, uh, to, to be able to be a professor here. And from there, then, we've been, continued to do work with UCLA students all over the world. Student, I've worked with my students in Russia, in Africa. I've worked with them in uh, northern Canada. We've continued that sort of uh, uh, study of past climate change and the impacts of modern climate change. 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about water, overall water, overall climate change, and how climate change due to uh, greenhouse gases may well affect water sustainability in southwestern North America and the United States, just to give you a sense of how interconnected things are, how interconnected what we do is, and also give you a sense of some of the limits of engineering or technological solutions to sustainability. Okay, so let's just take a little bit of a look at water in, uh, in Southern California. So, our most precious resource, okay? You might argue, you might have differences of opinion, but I think our most precious resource is Los Angeles, <laughs> okay? And Los Angeles has a bit of a problem. And all of the United States, in a sense, has a bit of a problem, which is we use an awful lot of water. Now, if we look at water consumption, this is average daily water usage per person in gallons on one side and liters on the other. The United States uses just about under 600 liters per day, about 160 gallons of water uh, per day. Now, that's amazing, right? I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, my showers are kind of long, but 160 gallons. In a minute, we'll see how that water is parsed out in our daily routine, OK? And probably your long shower isn't completely the culprit there, although you know one should watch what you're doing. Now, if we look at the rest of the world then, we go down and we see that, you know, we are probably average water consumption in the rest of the world would be somewhere around 80 to 60 gallons per day. So we're way, way above uh, what the average world's water consumption is. And if we get to some countries, such as Mozambique, you find that the average amount of water used is 5, 10 gallons a day, just barely enough for drinking and cooking, okay? So we are big, big consumers of water. Now, that wouldn't matter so much if we had lots and lots of water. Now, where do we use water? And this is interesting. You think, OK, low flush toilet, you know, that will help solve this problem. A shower head, a timer on the shower, uh, all of those sorts of things. But if we take a look at US residential water use, and this is certainly very true for Los Angeles, most of the water that we use in residential water use is used on your landscaping. Most of the water that's used in Los Angeles is used on watering lawns, OK? So if you look at landscaping, that is really where we're sucking up, particularly in a dry area such as Los Angeles, southwestern United States. If we have a verdant green landscape, which, which we like, which we find attractive, that's where most of the water is being used. And so as, a, as residential use in the average for the United States, over 50% of the water that we use is utilized in, uh, in landscaping. Leaks, it's really interesting, 6% are leaks. Disney in Anaheim did a big study of water looking to find leaks. And they, after a year of study and sealing up all the leaks, they saved themselves over $100,000 a year in water bills. Okay, just because of leaks all over the park. So they did a little bit of green accounting, looked at that, and they saved themselves an awful lot of money. So most of the water then that we utilize is in landscaping. That's not to take you off the hook in terms of you know, those long showers and things like that. But just to give you an idea where most of residential water use is. Now, to combat that, and when you're facing a water shortage, one of the things that the Department of Water and Power has done is they put in an incentive program in Los Angeles where if you take out your lawn and you put in a zero-fitic uh, type of a land cover, you can get actually a dollar per square foot to replace your lawn. And this is a sort of a program that you'd find in a number of different jurisdictions in the West. And indeed, Las Vegas was one of the leaders in putting in a lawn replacement program to try to get to a sort of a more sustainable water use uh, pattern. If we look at Las Vegas, you think, OK, so we're taking out lawns. Is that really going to matter? But they started their program in 1999. So they were way ahead of us in that. They started their program in 1999. And they, they removed about 70 million square feet of grass by paying people a modest sum to get rid of that grass. And then they, they actually decreased their water use over that time period by about 20 billion gallons. Okay, so 
it can really make a huge, huge difference. Just a program like that, replacing your lawn, not with like, you know, just uh, a, a dead dirt cover and whatever cars and RVs you choose to park, but with a sort of an attractive zero fitted gardening, maybe lots of stone, things like that, a few succulents. You can make it look really nice, and yet you can save a tremendous amount of water. A really simple solution. Now, if we look at then, where's all that water coming from that we use today on our lawns, that you use in your shower, that you use for all those sorts of things? Well, most of the water that you get here today, okay, comes from one of two sources in Los Angeles, Department of Water and Power, okay, which brings most of its uh, external water comes from the east side of the Sierra Nevadas, from near uh, Mammoth Lakes and the headwaters of the Owens River. Most of the rest of the water comes from something called the Metropolitan Water District, okay? The Metropolitan Water District has 26 member agencies and more than 300 sub-agencies that sell the water. They supply water for approximately 19 million people. So that's huge. 18 to 19 million people, including all of us here, depend in one way or the other on Metropolitan Water District water. And indeed, they supply water to the LA Department of Water and Power as well, although not all of the water. We use about 2 million acre feet. Okay, that's how much the Department of Water, or the Metropolitan Water District distributes between Ventura County all the way down to the, uh, the border between Mexico. So from Ventura County to San Diego County, that's the area that the Metropolitan Water District services, and they utilize about 2 million acre feet. When people manage water in North America, they use acre feet as the kind of measure for water. And that's a real simple measure. How much water, uh, it's the amount of water that will cover one acre of land, one foot in depth. Don't ask me why they have a crazy measure like that, but that's how it's measured, okay? An acre foot is the amount of water that would cover one acre of land to a depth of one foot. It's about 325,000 gallons, okay? Which again, that's really hard to picture, like all those little cans lined up, 325,000 of them. Basically though, one acre foot would serve the needs of two average size families for a year. So one acre foot would serve the needs of two average size families for about a year. And then this is the infrastructure that they have to distribute that water. Pumping stations, canal stations, pipe systems, storage reservoirs both above the ground and underneath the ground where they recharge water into aquifers. It is just unbelievable. The infrastructure that it takes to get water around here. Their facilities cover over 120,000 acres in and of themselves. There's like almost 3,000 miles of pipeline that the Metropolitan Water District uh, runs and maintains. This is a really massive organization that's required to, pr to pr supply 2 million acre feet of water, which is the drinking water for some 19 million people. Now, if we look then at how much water is used in Southern California, and this gets to the really the nub of a really difficult sort of a, a, a problem. If we look at the amount of water that's used in Southern California, and we're having a water shortage, like we're having right now, a drought. Right now, the Metropolitan Water District is in a level three sort of drought preparedness. You can only water your lawn two days a week. You can't water after nine o'clock. There's all kinds of rules. If you have a leak, if you break the rules, if you wash your car, if you're hosing down the sidewalk, you can get a ticket after a first warning. So we're in a pretty, pretty tough state right now. There are restrictions on use of water. Now you think, okay, well, we could pull out the lawns. Um, everybody has low flush toilets. We could recycle the drinking water. And we could really bring down that two million acre feet. And then, we, then we'll be sustainable. But if we actually look at how much water is used in Southern California, it's not just 2 million acre feet, which is used for the 19 million people served by the Metropolitan Water District. We use between 7 and 8 million acre feet. Where's the rest of that water being used? Any ideas? Yeah. Agriculture. Industry, not so much. Agriculture. When people talk about a water problem in the state of California, and they talk about solving it with low flush toilets or gray water recycling, 
those are parts of the solution. They're not going to fix it. You know why? 85% of the water, 80 to 85% of the water used in this state, it's used in agriculture. Okay, I'm not saying that the farmers are bad, agriculture's bad, let's stop eating, okay, so, you know, save, save the water molecule. But what I'm, saying, what I'm saying is that when you look for a solution to water here in the state of California, the cities are small potatoes compared to the agricultural enterprise of the state. That is where the vast majority of the water's going. In SoCal, it's about 65%. In the entire state, when you put in the Salinas Valley, San Joaquin, Sacramento Valleys, which are bread baskets for the nation, okay, about 80-85% of water use in this state is agriculture. So if you have a severe water shortage, you can use all the low flush toilets you want, you can walk around like this, whatever you do, you won't solve the problem that way. Okay, that's not enough. You've really got an issue with agriculture. And I'm not saying agriculture is bad. I'm just telling you, you've got to know where you're actually using your water. And that's it. So irrigation and agriculture. That's where we use most of the water in the state of California. And one of the biggest areas that uses it in Southern California is Imperial Valley. So is anyone from the Imperial Valley, Calexico? So that's a huge agricultural area. It has, yeah. You are part of the problem, okay? <laughs> no, she's like looking so sheepish. Get me out of here. Um, that, that, is, that is it, and this is what's cool. The number one crop, okay, recently is alfalfa, okay? Now, you guys go in and get those, you know, alfalfa all the time? Is that, you do, okay, so she's into it. But all of you, how many people use cheese, milk, dairy products? Like, okay, come on, you can admit it, all right, yeah, you go to In-N-Out Burger, get a shake, whatever. Which I believe In-N-Out Burger shakes are actually made with milk, and also Carl's Jr. McDonald's, I don't want to know what they're made out of, okay? <laughs> they're just scary. Anyway, um, alfalfa is the number one crop down there, about 173,000 acres in production. What do they use it for? You kind of don't go into Smart and Easy or whatever and buy a thing of alfalfa. Um, it's used to feed dairy cattle. That's, that's it. A small percentage is exported, but all those content California cows that you see on TV, a lot of them are eating alfalfa from the Imperial Valley. Okay? Now, one other crop that's interesting that's becoming more important in the Imperial Valley is turf grass, right? Which is cool. You take the water that we don't have enough of, you grow turf grass, which you then can sell to the city, so then they can use more of that water keeping the turf grass alive, okay? So if people who love lawns, what can I tell you? Partially, though, I have never have any luck keeping mine looking good anyway. Now, LA also has, then, when we go back to water, it really does have a suite of major problems facing it. And of which this little drought that we're in right now, this is just emblematic of the sorts of problems that Los Angeles faces. OK, well, that's one problem. <laughs> All right. Let's not get into that. Let's talk about the other problems. <laughs> what this is here is um, 1878 to 2005. This is precipitation measured in downtown LA at a climate station, OK, from 1878 to 2005. It's one of the oldest records we have in the Western US of continuous measurements of precipitation. So this is a, a meteorological station. They're measuring the water daily, and then they have the annual water totals, OK? And this is the total rainfall in centimeters, and this is the deviation from average. Remember, 30 centimeters is about a foot 13 inches, OK? So 30 centimeters is a foot, uh, uh, about a foot to 13 inches. Our average rainfall down here is between about 30 and 40 centimeters a year, depending where you are in the basin, 13, 14 inches. That's how much rainfall we get in a year. Now, I know when you get stuck out there and you don't have an umbrella, it seems like you're getting that in about five minutes. But if you actually took one year, that's all we get. That's the amount of rainfall we get, about a foot 14 inches. That's our average rainfall. What this shows is year by year from 1878 to 2005, the deviations from that. The gray lines, that, those are years with less than normal rainfall. The black lines are years when you have more than normal rainfall, OK? And that's what that's showing you. The first thing that you should take away from this, rudimentary statistics, is if you want to bet something, 
never bet that we're going to have an average year of rainfall, okay? Because e most years are either below the line or above the line. We very seldom have average rainfall. But even if we did, rainfall was average year in, year out. There's not enough rainfall falling to supply all the water needs of Southern California. In fact, since the turn, about the 1920s for sure, groundwater and rainfall have been insufficient to supply the needs of Southern California, city, industry, and agriculture. That's all we get. We have some stored as groundwater and we get this much. That's about 100 years now, that hasn't been enough. So that's one problem. We're in a semi-arid region, we don't have that much precipitation. Not enough to support agriculture and uh, the population in Southern California. So that's one problem. The second problem is this. If you're sitting here counting and saying, OK, I like to go to Vegas. I like to bet, right? I'm going to bet on the weather. I'm going to bet whether the rainfall is going to be above normal or below normal this year. If you're in California and you want the odds in your favor, bet that the rainfall is going to be below the average. Because if you count this up, the number of gray lines, years in which rainfall was lower than the average, there's more of those than years when rainfall was above the average. About 60% of the time, the rainfall is below the average. The annual rainfall is below the average. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, how can that be? I figure it's got to be 50-50. You know, you have one year with high rainfall, you have one year with low rainfall. You get this average. But it's a skewed distribution. Typically, your rainfall is below what the average is. And what happens is that every once in a while, you get these years of tremendous, huge rainfall. If you remember, 2005 was like that. Huge, huge rainfall. And that moves your average. It skews your distribution. So we get lots of years when we don't even get 13 inches. And then we get a few years where we might get twice that much, 26, 24 inches. The problem with those big rainfall years is they're infrequent, and we can't capture all of that rainfall. A lot of it then flows off a of saturated soil and out into the ocean, gone. So we have then a real tricky situation where we have many years where we don't even get 13 inches, 14 inches of rainfall. And then we get a few years, we get way too much rainfall. We can't effectively capture it all. The other thing is, I want you to notice those gray lines. There's many, many instances where year after year after year, three to five years in a row, you'll have lower than average precipitation. That then is a drought, OK? That then is when we have a drought situation. We get year after year of low precipitation. Typically, water districts in California plan for a three to five year drought. That's the window they plan for because typically that's the sort of extent where you'll have long droughts. You'll have three to five years. But you can see even over the 20th century, there were a number of periods where the drought was extended maybe out to seven or eight years, okay? So not only are we mainly, do we mainly have 60% chance of having a dry year, but oftentimes we get runs where it's dry year after dry year after dry year. The problem with that is then you deplete your reservoirs, right? Which is where you're storing the water because you've had, you're not replenishing them. So we have some real issues with water here. We don't have enough. We're prone to droughts. And when it rains, it pours, and we can't capture all of that. If we step back now and we look at that in a larger context, this is a precipitation map in inches for the whole of the United States. The red areas and yellow are dry. The blue and purple areas are wet. What you can see then is, in terms of arid regions, much of the west, west of the Mississippi River, is arid. The high mountains, such as the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades, the Rocky Mountains, the Uinta Mountains in Utah, they have fairly high precipitation at high elevations. But much of the west, not just California, is actually arid to semi-arid. We have low precipitation relative, for example, to the Great Lakes states or eastern North America. So this isn't just a, a problem peculiar to Los Angeles or California. 
This is a widespread issue in much of the Western United States outside of the Pacific Northwest. So how do we solve this problem then for Los Angeles? I said we don't have enough groundwater. We don't have enough precipitation. How do we then get this 8 million acre feet of water that we take? How does the Metropolitan Water District get the 2 million acre feet of water that you guys and I depend on? Well, basically, we reach out across Western North America. Okay, We get about 4.4 million acre feet of water every year from the Colorado River. That's what keeps Southern California kicking. Okay, Water coming in from the Colorado River. Where is that water originating from? All the way north to Wyoming, northern Utah, and Colorado. It flows down the Colorado River, and then we take it out of the river through the Cal Colorado River Aqueduct and through the All-American Canal. So a large, large part of our water, over 50% typically of the water we use in Southern California, it's coming from the Colorado River system, and most of that water is coming from Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming. Okay? So when you turn on your tap, you're drinking water that's coming from other states. Another large portion of the water that we get comes from the Los Angeles Aqueduct for the Department of Water and Power. That runs along the east of the Sierras and through the State Water Project through the uh, Sacramento and San Joaquin River Valleys. The biggest user of energy, one station user of energy in this state, is the pumping station that pumps, uh, one of the pumping stations that helps pump that water over the Tehachapi's <laughs> near the grapevine, the water coming from Northern California. So not only are we bringing water in from all over the Western United States, but we're using a lot of energy to do that and then distribute it through the Metropolitan Water District. So when you guys turn on your tap, the water molecules that you're, you're drinking or you're bathing with or you're using for washing up, it's a mixture of water that started out as snowfall uh, in Wyoming, that started as a rainstorm near Redding or Chico, that started as a late season hail storm uh, somewhere in Yosemite. Okay? That's where it's coming from, really from all over the western United States outside of the Pacific Northwest. Now, that sounds like a pretty good strategy, but there is a problem with this. Believe it or not, other states also want some of that Colorado River water. Okay? I'm hard to believe. Mexico wants some of that Colorado River water as well because the Colorado River enters the ocean at the Sea of Cortez. The Colorado River actually has a delta okay, at the Sea of Cortez. Starting in the 1920s then, they began to uh, divvy up the water from the, the Sacramento River in 1922, or from the Colorado River. That what they did is they looked at the flow on the Colorado River from 1905 to 1922. They said, okay, how much water has flowed down this river from 1905 to 1922? Because that's what they had records for. They had measured the flow of the river. And they said, right, okay, the average flow of the Colorado River at a place called Lee's Ferry, Colorado, uh, Lee's Ferry, which is right near the Arizona-Colorado border in Arizona, it was about 17 million acre feet. So they said the Colorado River, on average, brings 17 million acre feet down into Arizona, Mexico, California. So that's what we have to divvy up. And then they said, OK, let's be safe. Maybe there will be a drought. Let's not divvy up 17 million acre feet. Let's divvy up 16.5 million acre feet. Leaves you with a cushion, right? Do you have a little cushion? So there's the loser states, you know, Utah, 1.7 million acre feet. You know what I mean? New Mexico, 0.85 million acre feet. What do they need the water for? Um, we get 4.4 million acre feet. And this is the one I love the best, Nevada, 0.3 million acre feet. It's like dry up and die Las Vegas, OK? <laughs> They've got Lake Mead out there, and they can hardly get any of it. All right. Why is that? Well, because in 1922, Las Vegas, as we know it today, didn't exist. And basically, they said, no one in southern, no one's going to live in southern Nevada. 
I mean, what, what do you need water for? It's just a joke, right? And of course, now, of course, Las Vegas is a huge, one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the western United States. And we got 4.4 million acre feet because even then, people recognized just how cool Southern California was. No, actually, because it had a really big population, right? It had a large population compared to those other western states. So are people real happy about that? No, right? Because, I mean, we hardly produce any water that goes into the Colorado River. But we're sucking out. We're the biggest, uh, uh, we're the biggest recipient of water from the Colorado River. 1.5 million acre feet goes to Mexico. And that was a treaty which was negotiated in the 1940s. That 1.5 million acre feet continues to flow as long as there's not a serious drought. If we look at the long-term mean of water flow, this is the growth of the cities of Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas, OK? So the cities and demands and population and agriculture have all grown over that 100-year period from 1905 to 2005. If we look at now the measured long-term flow, now that we have 100 years of record, and we look at what the average long-term flow is of the Colorado, it's 15 million acre feet. How much did we give out? 16.5, right? A river that has an average flow of 15 million acre feet, we've given out 16.5 million acre feet. Okay? That sounds like a typical college student's monthly budget, all right? <laughs> Except like there's no ma or pa or brother or uncle or someone to phone up and say, hey, guess what? Okay? That's it. We've, we've basically allocated more water per year than actually flows down the river. So we have a big, big issue there. A uh, place that's really suffered from this all has been the Colorado Delta. That's the Colorado River Delta there, right? It's like a desert, right? It's basically like a desert. The only water that goes through the delta now is basically kind of seepage that comes from the Imperial Valley of, of California and the Mexicali agricultural region of Mexico. There's no water that's flowing down that river and going into the delta. If that delta was on U.S. territory, right, because of Endangered Species Act and, 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 uh, and, and uh, legislation which we have to protect wetlands, that would never happen. But because that delta has just the unfortunate uh, situation of being located south of the border, we feel we have no responsibility for it. And so we will spend millions on the Sacramento Delta, okay? The Colorado Delta, because it happens to be in Mexico, we don't do anything about it. I, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that. I think it's just grossly unfair. Um, the other thing that we've done is, because water is so tight, there's this big, big canal which runs along the Mexico-California border called the All-American Canal. And it didn't used to be lined. It used to be just sort of an uh, open trench. And water went through it. And seepage from that water then went across the border to Mexicali. And it was an important hydrological study show. It was an important means of recharging groundwater. Uh, in Mexicali region. Well, because we're so worried about this water, we've allocated more water than flows in the river. We've had a big project then to line the canal with concrete. What would lining the canal with concrete do? It means that there's more water that comes to Imperial Valley or down to uh, San Diego, which is where some of the water goes. It means it's no longer recharging the groundwater in the Mexicali region. It also means you have less seepage that's going through that pretty much dead Colorado Delta. OK, so if you go south of the border, you really see where it's hit the wall in terms of Colorado River water. Now, here's the real scary part, and this is where we are now. We're hearing about all this stuff about uh, drought in California, water conservation, be water wise, getting a ticket for watering your lawn, et cetera. OK, this isn't because we've had one year of dry conditions, all right? The, this century now is being called by Western um, hydrologists, people working on water issues in Western United States, the 21st century drought. And in fact, some people say this is the new 21st century climate. This is a map starting in May of 2001. That's the end of the main precipitation, winter precipitation season, all the way to April of 2008. So most of these maps are for May, the end of the winter precipitation season. Brown, red, and yellow means drought. Means unusually dry compared to long-term average conditions. 
What I want you to notice is for the western United States, and particularly for Southern California and the Colorado River Basin, almost every single year has been a drought year. I mean, this, isn't, this is not drought anymore. We're entering, some people argue, a new climate state. And that climate state is dry in the Colorado River Basin. It's dry in Southern California. And that's what seems to be the story of the 21st century. This was March 17, 2009, so the end of this year leading into where we are now. And you can see, you've got your yellow, brown, and, uh, and sort of ochre colors right up from Southern California, San Joaquin Valley, Sacramento Valley, up into the headwaters of the Colorado River. So what we're having is something that I've written a few articles, including an article in the LA Times about, called a perfect drought. And that is that Southern California is being hammered. Temperatures are high, so evaporation is high. We have very little precipitation. Our two main sources of water, Northern California and that huge Colorado River Basin, are also being hammered at the same time. And there you can see one line that's from 1905 to 2005. One line, the red one is Sacramento River flow, important for Northern California water, which we transfer here. The blue one is annual precipitation here in Southern California, and the green one is Colorado River flow. Now you can see it many times in the past, maybe the Sacramento River is flowing low, but the Colorado is pretty high. They're not lining up doing the same thing at the same time. But every once in a while, we'll get these perfect droughts, where the Colorado system, the Sacramento system, and, Northern, or and Southern California are all in drought for the same time and it persists for more than a year. And you can see then, starting at about 2000, we went into what's the most extensive of these perfect droughts that we have on record yet. That is the 21st century. And so far it's been a century of perfect drought in terms of our water supply. That's why if you go to the Metropolitan Water District uh, website, they have this little water reserve levels. 2006, we were cooking. We just came off a pretty good year in Southern California, not for the Colorado Basin, but for Southern California. 2008, we're getting close to empty, OK? Now, when I drive a car, that E stands for excellence, OK? But in this case, the E on the tank means empty, OK? We really are depleting our above-ground reservoir resources pretty good. Let's hope for a sort of a wet year this year. You can see it in the paper, both sides of the border. OK? Real issues with water. How many people have been to Hoover Dam at Lake Mead? Quite a few of you. How many people have been to Vegas? Oh, yeah, most of you. All right. If you're out at Vegas sometime, you can drive out to Bullhead City and go out to Hoover Dam and Lake Mead. It is really, really cool. Hoover Dam is really, really cool to look at. Lake Mead's kind of interesting. And it kind of clears your head of all the sort of uh, parties at the Hard Rock Pool and all that stuff. OK? So, I went in 2005 out there, because every once in a while I've been known to go to Vegas myself, and uh, went out real early in the morning when it's cool. And this was in August, and I want to take a picture. I'm standing on Hoover Dam, and I'm looking at Lake Mead. Okay, And I wanted to take a picture, because you see that white rim there? They didn't paint that because it looked cool. Okay, What that is, is it's called the bathtub ring, but the top of that white rim that's where the normal capacity of Lake Mead is. That's your normal capacity when the reservoir is full, everything's good. That's where it is, OK? And at 2005, because of this long drought in the Colorado Basin, that had dropped several tens of meters. And I thought, this is going to be a really exciting picture. I mean, you know, who knows when it will be this low again? So I went out there and I took that picture. And so what I want you to notice a couple things. One is you see this kind of red band, pinky band there. OK, take a look at that. Also, uh, just look at the general state of that white band, which was normally where it would have water, but was now dry because of the drought starting about 2000, 2001. There's just for scale, there's a little boat out there. It's maybe a fisherman or maybe Homeland Security, right? Because they're trying to protect the dam. All right. <laughs> then I went out in 2007. OK, now check this out. Look at that little pink line there. OK? At this point, the dam is now way below 50% capacity. The reservoir is below 50% capacity. 
That's that little pink band, OK? Notice, you're getting vegetation now, reclaiming the former, you know, former water uh, filled areas of the reservoir. So you've got all those plants. One thing hasn't changed, though. That dude is still out there in the boat, OK? <laughs> you see him? I don't understand it, but anyway, there he is. So Lake went down to about 48% capacity. There was a study by UC San Diego Scripps Institute. They suggest that by 2020, Lake Mead will be at Deadpool. What does that mean, Deadpool? OK, it's not one of the pools in Vegas where they've gone in and they've stopped all the sort of pool parties, OK? Did anyone know that they've done that? No. Three, yeah, three may. In fact, Rio will no longer be having its pool party anymore. They all got slapped with big fines. It's OK, why am I talking about this? <laughs> anyway, a um, little bit too much time in Vegas, huh? Um, by 2020, it will be a dead pool. Dead pool means that the water level will be so low, it can no longer run through the turbines. So not only will no water be going below Lake Mead, but the turbines, which generate a huge amount of electricity for Western United States, they won't be running. Now, the Department of Reclamation, the government that runs the dam, say, no, no, that won't happen. But UC San Diego scientists predict that that the reservoir simply may dry up. We won't be able to generate hydroelectricity there. And that may happen by 2020. So there, you know, this is scary stuff, kids. And it's not just North America, possibly, that's being affected by this. What this is, is it's based on 19 different climate models looking at greenhouse gas warming and how greenhouse gas warming would affect droughts worldwide. And this was published in the journal called Science in 2007. Areas with brown and the sort of beigey and tan colors, those are areas that 18 of 19 climate models predict are going to become drier or more arid as we move into the 21st century. And you can see that right off the coast of California and Mexico is one of those areas extending up through the Colorado River Basin. And you can see they extend as a huge band right across the northern and southern hemisphere at about 30 degrees north and south latitude. Look at some of the other areas which are being affected. The Mediterranean and, mid and uh, Middle Eastern region, India-Pakistan border region, southern Mexico, Guatemala, Australia, southern Africa, southern part of South America. A huge band, both sides of the equator. 18 of 19 climate models suggest they're becoming drier, more arid, more drought prone due to climate warming influences. And that what we're seeing in southwest United States and California seems to be part of this overall global pattern. That's why people are saying, let's stop talking about drought. Let's stop, start talking about the new climate of the southwest, the new climate of California, which is a drier climate. And we already have a water delivery system which sustainability is in question. And it's, it's drying out. Now, just real quick then, the kind of research I'm doing, which a lot of our research is about things that happened in the past. What's the possible relevance of a drought 500 or 1,000 years ago to understanding how scary the 21st century might be? Well, it's hard to do. You can use climate model experiments, but it's hard to do big global experiments of the environment. I mean, how do you do an experiment where you say, OK, let's turn up the temperature and see what will happen in California? You can do that in a climate model, a computer simulation, but you obviously can't run that experiment in real time, real world. But fortunately, climate itself has run some of those experiments for us. The world's climate, California's climate, is not some sort of steady state, but it changes due to external or internal forces. And for instance, between about 800 and about 1300 AD, the sun was a little bit, little bit more active, a little tiny bit more solar activity, and there didn't happen to be much volcanic activity, about between 800 and 1300 AD. A little bit stronger, more intense sun due to natural internal features of the sun, and just happened to coincide of a period of time where there was a little bit less volcanic activity. When you have less volcanic activity, you have less sulfur oxides in the atmosphere, and sunlight penetrates through the atmosphere a little bit easier. 
So less volcanic activity, better penetration of sunlight, a more active sun, a little bit more solar uh, radiation. Just real tiny. And we know, we, we know we've measured these things using various proxies. And so what you have, these are different reconstructions of temperature, northern hemisphere temperature, for the last two to 1,000 years. And there's a little bump there between 800 and 1300 AD. Little increase in temperature, less than a degree, but a significant increase in average temperature. And many, many studies have shown this. We call this the medieval warm period because it coincides with the medieval historical period in Europe, about 800 to 1300 AD. The world was a little bit warmer, natural causes, natural climate warming. Then it cooled down, and we have something called the Little Ice Age, 1600 to 1800. Very, very cold temperatures. And then you can see where the 20th and 21st century is, OK? Sort of going right off the map. So we've really, really warmed up. Many parts of the world were warmer right now than it's been in at least one to 2,000 years. OK, so we know that we're really, really in a warm period. But here's the thing. Maybe we can look at what happened to California water resources or western US water resources 800 to 1300 years ago when we had a natural warm period. And we could see, would this really produce a switch to a more arid climate, really deep, extensive droughts? You know, will, will climate warming like that shift our hydrologic regime to this more arid state? So we have a little experiment, and that's the kind of research we do. Now, the problem is that there was no gauging station on the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry 100, I mean 1,000 years ago or 800 years ago. And that's where they measure right now the flow of the Colorado River. So what we, what we use is we use tree rings, OK? We study tree rings. And it's not like we're looking for trees that are growing in the Colorado River. We look for trees in the mountains around the river on years when there's a lot of rain and a lot of water in the river, they have wide rings because they have lots of water. On years when there's not much uh, rainfall, they have really narrow rings. And that would be a year when the river flows very poorly. And we can statistically correlate the flow of the river with precipitation and statistically correlate that with the width of the tree rings. Los Angeles. How old do you think the oldest trees are around LA? Any ideas? What's that? 150 to 200 years old. No. Other guesses? 1,000 years. Yeah. Some of them actually are 1,300 years old. And the oldest trees around LA are pine trees up at the top of Mount Baldy or Mount San Gorgonio, Mount San Jacinto. There are pine trees out there that are 1,000 to 1,300 years old. And they've been collecting information in their rings on precipitation year after year. Down here where we have mainly oak trees and things, then it's true. Most of them are only 150 to 200 years old. But when you get up to those high mountains, and we don't think of that as LA, but you can see those, those trees from down here if you have a telescope, they're 1,000 years old. But down in the basin, 150, 200 years old, that's a pretty good average. But up there, 1,000. So we can reconstruct then over long periods of time what was going on. I'm not going to show you that. Uh, we can reconstruct over long periods of time what was going on with precipitation and rainfall and see what happened 1,000 years ago when we had this last period of global warming. And where would we do that? Anyone know where this is? <laughs> Acapulco. OK. I know. This, is like, this was the famous place for like, I mean, this was the Cancun and Cabo and everything all rolled into one in the 50s and 60s. And still is like very, very popular if you're in uh, Mexico City to go down and have a vacation there and stuff like that. Now, why I digress. OK, why am I showing you this picture? Um, I was so interested in what happened 1,000 years ago, 800 years ago, when there was this last period of global warming. It happened to be that the American Geophysical Union, which are group of nerds like myself, scientists studying all kinds of different things about climate change and environmental change and the geophysics of the Earth. They had their first ever meeting in Latin America, and it was going to be held in Acapulco. And I thought, this is so cool because it's going to bring Mexican scientists together, US scientists, Canadian scientists. This would be, and this, this drought is affecting all of us. This would be a great time to bring together scientists from the three North American countries 
and actually say, well, what can we discover about what happened last time there was natural climate warming? And are we likely to be heading into one of these big, big drought phases now? And so we organized a meeting then at Acapulco for the American Geophysical Union where we had over 20 scientists from Mexico, United States, Canada, and even Great Britain. And we all brought our data together, climate model results, paleo uh, climate data of climate in the past, everything to try to look at this. And we published then an article uh, in EOS, which is the Journal of the American Geophysical Union. And this is what we found, and it wasn't good, okay? What we found is we could map a period of intense drought, 60 year long period between 1130 and 1180 AD, 50 to 60 years, that occurred in the past. And we could map it from having all kinds of different evidence of aridity. And that drought lasted, as I said, 50 to 60 years, went from Southern California right through the Colorado River Basin, right through Northern Mexico, and all the way to Southern Canada. That's that drought, 1130 to 1180 AD. Forget about a seven-year drought, a five-year drought. We're talking 50 to 60 years of drought. That's the current drought, 2000 to 2007, average drought conditions. It's almost identical in its geographic extent. It looks just the same as the medieval warm period drought. What we then mapped out here was, this is 1,000 years ago, that's 2000 AD. Up at the top is solar forcing. The red line is how strong the sun was. The little lines underneath it, that's volcanic activity. And what you can see is the 11th century, right around 1130 to 1180, that's when there was a peak of warming and a decrease of volcanic activity. That was the last natural peak of climate warming before what we're seeing today due to greenhouse gases. That was a really particular time when the, warm, when the climate was warm for natural causes. Right at the same time, 1130 to 1180, where Western United States, including California, basically dried up. We then plotted out, and the, the top three things have to do with the ocean. If you're really interested in that, when you're seniors, take a course with me on that. But we plotted up then drought, the flow of the North Saskatchewan River, the Colorado River, and the Sacramento River. And we found that throughout Western North America at that time period, last time it was warm, there was a huge drought. We found that the Colorado River flow decreased and was decreased for about 60 years. The Sacramento River flow decreased and was decreased for about 60 years. And even all the way up into Canada, you had a decrease in flow. Los Angeles was in a state of drought, not just during the 12th century, 1100 to 1200. But it was almost in a continuous state of drought from about 900 to 1200 AD. Seems to be Los Angeles area was particularly, particularly sensitive to this last period of global warming. So from that then, we published an article which basically said, if the past is any guide to the future, the last time we had climate warming in California, we basically slipped into a new climate state. And we would call that climate state essentially continuous drought. So if we're talking about water sustainability today, and we're talking about moving forward into the 21st century, supporting the agriculture population of California, not only do we have to worry about the fact that this is generally an arid region, that we've given away more Colorado River water than actually flows in the river, but that we're probably going to continue this pattern of very dry conditions, broken up with a few years of wet conditions and a few years of normal rainfall, but in all probability, based on the evidence that we have like this in climate models, we've, we're moving into a new arid state. And if we think about sustainability, we have to think about a drier world than the 20th century. That's the end of my talk. Thanks a lot.